Okay, so let's move on. So uh, we have now a presentation by uh, Aubrey Poon from uh, Rebro University. So Aubrey, you have about uh, 25 minutes. Okay, the floor is yours. Thanks to the organizers for accepting our paper in this nice conference. So um, this is joint work with Josh, who's in the audience, um, and David and Dan, and the whole premise of this talk is centered towards uh, conditional forecasts. So conditional forecast is sort of a projection of a set of variables of interest um, condition on some other, the future path of some other variables. So um, conditional forecast is very popular within empirical macroeconomics. Um, and it's thanks to this seminar work by um, Wagner and Zarr, um, this 1999 restat paper where they introduced conditional forecasts within a VR framework. And also I know that the ECB has this bare toolbox that um, implements conditional forecasts. So conditional forecast is very popular. And I presume some people in this audience have used implemented conditional forecasts at one stage of their research career. So um, conditional forecasts are example of conditional forecasts. Uh, for example, imagine um, we have a simple two variable VAR. Um, uh, we're modeling real GDP and a policy rate. So conditional forecast um, is, for example, we're interested in forecasting real GDP for the next two quarters, conditioning on the policy rate to be at 2% for the next two quarters. So this is an example of what a conditional forecast is. So there's sort of two types of conditional forecasts. Um, the traditional reduced form case. So the example that I gave you in the beginning, that is an example of um, the traditional case where its conditions is generated by all the structural shocks in the model. So this is sort of um, called conditional on observables. The other type of conditional forecast is um, structural scenario analysis, where, for example, um, imagine now we're interested in forecasting real GDP, but conditioning on um, the policy shocks. So this is an example called um, conditional shocks. So there is a recent JME paper by Antonio Diaz and his co-authors where they produce sort of a unified framework to, um, for conditional forecasts and structural anal analysis within our VAI mo uh, models. So in the traditional case, there's sort of two types of conditional forecasts, the hard and soft um, condition um, forecasts. So the example that I gave you um, in the beginning where um, we're forecasting real GDP, real GDP conditioning on the policy rate to be 2%. That's an example of a hard condition where con the conditioning variable is fixed to a particular value. However, it may be the case now, what if we're interested in um, conditioning the policy rate to be um, between an interval? So this is an example of a soft condition. So instead of fixing the conditioning variable to a particular value, we're conditioning the value to um, an interval. So within the literature, um, the hard condition is the most popular uh, employed in the empirical literature. So one of the reasons why the soft condition forecast is sort of more scarce um, in the literature is sort of due to the computational challenges associated with generating soft conditional forecasts. And in the original restat paper by Wagner and Zarr, they used this sort of naive acceptance of rejection um, algorithm that sort of requires a large number of simulated draws to satisfy the constraints. So there have been a recent paper by um, Anders, this Anderson and et al. paper in 2010 that has introduced um, the soft constraints, um, but this algorithm is still, um, still only really catered to sort of low dimension VARs. So it's, so in my opinion, as a forecaster, I think the soft constraint is a lot more intuitive compared to the hard constraint, because um, you can think about it in terms of um, as your forecast horizon increases, as you, as you have a, a longer forecast horizon, often you don't know what the conditional variable is in the longer forecast horizon. So it's intuitive to, you know, it's a lot more intuitive to impose that conditional variable between a VAT, uh, between an interval than a fixed value. So that's why I think the condition, the soft condition um, um, 
construct the soft condition condition forecast is a lot more insured as a forecaster, and also you can take into consideration the uncertainty around your conditional variable. So that's one of the the uh, beauties of um, implementing a soft condition conditional forecast. So, uh, so what is our sort of main contribution of our paper? So we sort of produce this novel precision-based approach that generalizes conditional forecasts um, in a numerous ways. So basically our paper is similar to this Antonio Diaz and his co-author paper, where our precision-based method is sort of a close form, um, is close form and um, it can be used for conditional forecasts and structural analysis. And the and the beauty of using our position pace approach is that it's more efficient, um, especially as we go into large dimensional VARs, and also where we can implement um, a large number of um, hard or soft condition variables and also a longer forecast horizon. So our proposed framework is similar to a paper that Josh and Dan just and I just recently um, published at the Journal of Econometrics where we sort of applied our position-based approach to um, stakes-based models with missing data. So, um, um, th so the main contribution in terms of generating the soft constraint conditional forecast is that we sort of do this by com combining the position-based approach um, and with this uh, exponential min-max tilting method so this position-based approach, which um, Josh is uh, the, very, the pioneer of, is basically, if you think about, if you don't know what the position-based um, sampler is, it's basically a vectorized version of Kármán filter. So, and one of the advantages of using the position-based approach is that you can exploit this fast band, band uh, uh, matrix algorithm. So, um, so um, as I said, um, the soft constraint um, to generate the, once we impose a, a soft constraint on the conditional forecast, then we need to draw from this uh, high dimensional uh, multivariate um, truncated Gaussian distribution. And that's the reason why we're implementing this Botev method. So remember um, in the beginning, uh, the Wagner Zar method um, I, talked to, I talked about, they used this acceptance and rejection um, algorithm to generate this conditional forecast. So basically, this Botev method, you can think about it, it's an acceptance of rejection algorithm, but it's more sophisticated. So in a sense that your proposal distribution that you're generating um, the draws from, it's, it's going to satisfy the constraint most often of the time compared to the Wagner and Zar method where it's sort of a naive acceptance of rejection sampler. Okay, so, um, so the outline of the presentation is that we want to propose a general framework to conditional forecast. So if I have time, um, I'll derive both the hard constraint, hard and soft constraint conditional forecast distribution. And in, in the simulation study, we sort of compare our method to four existing methodologies in the literature, the Wagner and Zar, and the Bambao et al. This is basically, they just use filtering and smoothing methods um, um, to generate the conditional forecast. As I mentioned, the Antonio Diaz and his co-authors method and the and it's an um, et al method for the soft constraint conditional forecast. So, um, and lastly, um, we apply our sort of a no novel position based conditional forecast on a large Bayesian VAR where we implemented number, number of multiple hard and soft constraints, which is um, the first, which is the sort of first study that's done in the literature. Okay, so what we wanna begin is, um, I'll just quickly go through the, like the general frame it for conditional forecast. So here is just, we have a, a standard um, uh, structural VAR with P lags. So we have um, A naught is our contemporaneous matrix and we have you know, our standard you know, VR coefficients. So basically what we wanna do is um, we wanna, given all our t um, time periods up to time T, what we want to do is sort of summarize all our unconditional forecasts of our observables in our VR. So that's what um, this last equation is doing here. We're just summarizing all our unconditional forecasts of our VAR for um, the H step ahead. So um, this H matrix you can think about is a banded matrix. So and you can think about this, um, this all these elements on the um, diagonal. These are sort of the iterated uh, VR coefficients. So the big picture is 
this last equation just summarizes all the unconditional forecasts um, across the H step ahead period. And then um, given that um, you know, determinant H um, is not equal to zero, and um, so the inverse exists, then we can get back this equation one, where the unconditional forecast fo follows this uh, multivariate Gaussian distribution with this uh, mean and covariance term. And since, as I said, the H matrix is a banded matrix, we can use the position-based sampler of Chan and Zelikov to efficiently draw all the unconditional forecast in one single block. Okay, so what we want to do next is basically uh, we want to put some restrictions on this, the future path of the, our observables. So this R matrix is what we're doing. We're just putting some sort of restriction on that. And the, the small R and the omega are just the associated restrictions on these um, condition, restrictions on the, the future path of the observables. So... Um, basically, given um, equation two and one, we can sort of substitute, um, um, we can combine these two and then we get back equation three. So equation three, big picture, is basically, it's telling up the story of the conditional observables case. This, this, this big matrix R on the, on this, um, the vector um, of all the unconditional, foreca unconditional forecasts is just putting a restriction on the future path of observables. And, um, equation three is explaining the conditional on observables case. But what we want to do here is we want to pro provide a, a general framework. So we want to sort of show equivalence between the conditional and shocks case. So basically, what if now on equation three, the epsilon, we want to put some sort of restriction on these shocks. And that's basically what equation four is doing. We're putting um, some restrictions on the shocks of the, the conditional forecast. And equation four, uh, is basically explaining that relationship. And then the next equation, combining th equation three and four, we're then showing this relationship that um, the conditional observable, con conditional observable case sort of relates to the conditional shots case. And to solve equation five, because given that um, we assume that the number of shocks is less than uh, the number of observables, so this equation five is sort of undetermined and has multiple solutions. Um, so what we do is we follow Antonio Diaz and his co-authors, and we just um, what they do is they just use this. They pick one solution and they choose this uh, Moore and Penrose inverse. So then um, we can solve um, that um, equation five and sort of equation six. Big picture is just to show the equivalence between the conditional on observables case and the conditional on shocks case. And depending on sort of what we set for R and omega, we can either set for a conditional observables case or conditional shocks case. And then equation six is basically, the result of equation six is that we can now sort of generate uh, a, a general framework for uh, a general distribution of the conditional forecast distribution, which is denoted by um, this term here. So this result is very general, and it can enc encompass a lot of um, useful and popular um, conditional forecast um, forecasting. So it's just depending on what you set for R and omega, and you can get back conditional shocks case or conditional observables case. Okay, so um, as I said, what we want to do too is extend our, our conditional uh, forecast framework to include soft conditioning. So in a sense, we're conditioning on the, the future. We're assuming, um, we're putting some interval on the conditional variables, and that's basically equation seven. Well, what we're doing is we're putting, um, uh, we're allowing the conditional variables to fall within our, our, our interval. And then as a result of sort of equation seven, that sort of now becomes that, we have to draw from a, sort of a, a multivariate um, truncated uh, normal distribution, which is what equation eight is telling us. So in that sense, we need to use this Botev method where we're simulating for high dimensioning truncated um, Gaussian distribution. Okay, so, uh, so I, I won't go too much in detail with um, the, the hard constraint, but basically I'm just gonna, you know, you know, we go through the maths. Basically, what you do is you partition the, the two. Um, so equation nine is basically you're partitioning the, the constrained variables and the unconstrained variables into a linear combination. 
Um, so that's what equation nine is. So basically the y naught is um, the vector of high constraints. So imagine in our two variable VR case, real G, um, policy rate falls into that vector, real GDP falls into y um, u. So basically what's what we're doing, then equation nine, we substitute that into equation one, then you know we can get back, we can sort of derive the conditional density of the unconstrained, um, the conditional forecast given the conditional variables. So basically go through some maths and then um, um, we can sort of derive this distribution for the, um, the hard constraint conditional forecast. And um, since the H matrix and MU matrix are banded matrix, we can simulate um, the conditional forecast from a hard constraint using a precision sampler um, efficiently. Okay, so um, the soft constraint, um, as I said now, um, for example, um, instead of um, forecasting real GDP, we're conditioning on um, between two, two, two and three percent. So now we need to draw from our truncated multivariate uh, normal distribution. So in this, um, so in this case, I'm not going to go through the maths, um, but I'm just going to give you the intuition. So as I said, we're just combining this um, the precision sampler with this uh, sort of this Botev method, this uh, this uh, exponential min max tilting method. So the intuition you can read or you can talk to me after or Josh if you want to know the ins and outs for the soft constraint um, algorithm. But basically, what we do is we draw from this trunk, we draw the constraint variable marginally from this. Um, multivariate truncated normal using this BOTEF method. And then given that draw, then we can um, generate the conditional forecast using the precision sampler. So that's just the basic intuition behind that. Um, but, okay. But um, what I wanna, wanna do now is in a simulation um, study, we wanna compare our proposed precision-based approach um, to existing methodologies. Um, so the hard constraint we compare um, against the Wagner and Zar, the Babimbara et al, um, which is a filter and smoothing method, and the Antonio Diaz method. For the soft constraint, we only can compare it against the Wagner and Zar and the Anderson and et al method. Um, so the Babimbara et al and the Antonio Diaz and his co-authors, um, you can't impose a soft constraint conditional forecast within their framework. So um, that's the reason why we can't compare it um, with them for the soft constraint. Okay, so what we do is, this is the, just the details of the um, simulation study. So I'm not gonna go too much detail, but basically um, yeah, these are the details and we just um, you estimate using standard uninformed and priors. Okay, so basically what we consider our simulation study for the hard constraint is we have a, a medium VAR with a short forecast horizon. So an eight variable VAR, with you know a five step ahead, and we have three constraint um, variables. A large VR, we also consider a large VR case with a long forecast horizon, so a fifteen variable with um, a twenty step ahead, and again um, three constraint variables. Um, um, we estimated using twenty five thousand MC MC jaws and with ten thousand burning period, and these are sort of the the graph. Um, this is the graph, the conditional forecast for the first four variables for the large um, VR case. And you can see that the posterior estimates across the four um, um, methods are exactly the same. So basically, our position-based approach generates exactly the same estimates as the three other existing high constraint methods. So, um, but you, you want to say, because I mentioned our method is computationally more efficient. So what we do is we just sort of derive um, a table where we compute the computational times. So we have a medium, large, and extra large. So the medium large is um, what I've defined in the simulation study previously. Extra large is a 40 variable case. And here, you know, the H step ahead means the forecast horizons. The N, N naught is basically the number of constraints. So you can sort of see that um, other for the, the, the um, two lags and a four flag, the number, um, our position-based approach is clearly more computationally efficient compared to the three existing methods. Okay, so let me, um, so basically what we do next is do a simulation study for the soft constraint. It's basically um, an eight variable VAR and with a long forecast horizons with one soft constraint. Again, um, you know, 
we sort of impl implement similar details to um, the height constraint. Okay, so again, our posterior estimates gives us exactly the same estimates as the Wagner Czar and um, the Anderson and the Tal method, but how does it compare in terms of computational time? So in terms of computing this conditional forecast, um, our position-based method took 62 seconds, and um, the Anderson et al. method is competitive, took 70 seconds, well, whereas the original Wagner and Czar method took like 2005 um, minutes, like really um, computationally um, inefficient. But you, can, you might say, oh, you know, the Anderson et al. method is sort of a competitor, uh, it's quite competitive, but yes, so what we do next is to we explore um, how our position-based method compared to the Anderson et al. method, where you can sort of see that um, for the n or means the number of constraints. So you can see that um, for one constraint, the our position-based method and the Anderson et al. method is gives you pretty much the same um, in terms of computation efficiency. But as the number of um, constraints increases, clearly our position-based method is um, better than Anderson and et al. method. Okay. So for the empirical application, what we do is we estimate a large Bayesian VAR, um, a 31 um, um, variable quarterly VAR. Um, so basically all our, our sort of our VAR follows from this Pomp et al. method. Um, so we, we estimate uh, our, our, our large Bayesian VAR using this, uh, this um, asymmetric natural conjugate Minnesota pride that Josh has in QE. And basically what we do is we investigate um, um, the macroeconomic impact of a combination of the soft, a multiple soft and hard constraint at once. So we are sort of the first study that do, does this. Okay, so basically what we do is we estimate the model up until 2019, and then we impose a soft and hard constraint on CPI, uh, unemployment, and a 10-year treasury, tre treasury rate. And the constraint that we implement mimic the baseline and adverse scenarios of the Federal Reserve uh, stress, 2020 stress test. So here's just an example of the soft constraints. So we impose a soft constraint in CPI and um, a hard constraint on the unemployment rate and the treasury yield. And you can see that um, the con this is quite complex because our um, the low ba the the bounds for the soft constraint it changes over time. So this this soft constraint, so this you know this type of scenario is very complex. Um, and this so that's the baseline case. This is the adverse um, scenario case, and these are just the results. So uh, I don't have much much time, but basically th these are you know we have real GDP, um, industrial production, business sector um, per hour, housing starts. Um, stock market and, and the VIX. Basically, this is the the conditional for the the baseline um, scenario. So this is where the economy is moving along steadily. So you can see that you know the the red line is the unconditional for the conditional forecast, and the blue line is sort of the 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 unconditional forecast. And you can see that majority of the real variables are increasing. For the baseline case, you can think about this as a, a negative shock to the economy, like a COVID shock. And you can see that for the red line, majority of the real variables, um, the conditional forecast drops. So, um, so to conclude, um, basically we propose this novel position-based approach um, for conditional forecasts, and, and it can encompass uh, various things like scenario analysis or entropy tilting. So our approach is um, computationally more efficient and you can handle re really large dimensional VARs as well as number of large conditioning variables and long forecast horizons. And basically, um, the simulation study shows that we generate exactly the same method, same estimates as all the existing methodology in our uh, existing methodology in the literature, but we're more computationally efficient. So, so basically, in terms of the empirical application, basically what I want to say is that um, the, our empirical application is just to illustrate the complexity of our scenario because um, previously in the existing literature, you cannot implement these multiple hard constraints. And 
basically our empirical application, we just want to show that um, given our algorithm, we can you, you can do very complex stuff, which previous algorithms or methods in the literature cannot do. So yeah, basically our next step is extend our framework to nonlinear models like a Bayesian virus SV, and we sort of want to create a conditional forecast toolbox for people in the central bank and researchers. And that's it. Many thanks, Aubrey, for this very good paper and super important for practitioner. Okay, so the discussion is done by uh, Julia Mantuan from the Bank of England. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Aubrey, for this uh, presentation. Uh, I really, I really like to read this paper. I think it's a very elegant uh, paper, I have to say. Um, so, but as any paper by Aubrey, that, is, that are very technical, this paper. So, I'm just going to um, discuss a few points that I really like and um, some questions that probably I have because I couldn't understand. Okay, so all the questions are on my side. Okay, so. Um, so the framework in which the paper is uh, written is uh, building from uh, Antonin Diaz, Petrella, and Rubio Ramirez, 2021. So what they uh, work on is uh, having a, uni, uh, a united framework uh, where they, tr they um, propose a framework where you can do several things. Okay, so you can do uh, constraining in uh, uh, your forecast on hard constraints, soft constraints. So the difference between this one is just on uh, how certain you are about your constraint, right? So if you want to constrain on a specific path of future events, you have an hard constraint. Otherwise, if you are unsure about this, you can um, include some uncertainty in your constraining, uh, allowing for um, your constraint to uh, be a range of numbers. Okay, then the same constraints you can apply to uh, both observables and um, structural shocks. So, and then of course you can combine um, sub constraints on. Okay, you, you can um, combine hard and soft constraints, both on observables and uh, structural shock, and doing some scenario analysis. Okay, so this is a, a very ambitious task, as I was saying. And then um, you you can use this uh, precision-based sampler, which is uh, um, quite efficient. Okay, so. Uh, the reason why um, we can, at the moment, um, we we cannot very easily to do uh, impose soft constraint in our forecast is because the literature in Wagon and Enza, they uh, basically just rely on a accept, accept reject algorithm, which you know obtains candidates drawn from unconstrained distribution. So you need a lot of draws in order to get um, um, enough to build your forecast. So let me move on. So. Um, so I really like the paper because it's very elegant, it's very general, and you can get all of the different specification. Uh, however, I was a bit lost in understanding what the contribution comes from. So my understanding is that the contribution comes from two, from applying two different algorithms. Uh, this one, the Chen and uh, Gilliads of 20, uh, 2009, and uh, the Botev 2017 for soft constraint. Uh, however, for me, it was a bit difficult to understand what do I need to do in order to run this uh, algorithm. So what do I understand is that I need to re derive the conditional forecasting distribution in terms of inverse covariance matrix. Uh, so then my question is, is this correct? Is this the only thing that I need to do? Is there anything else that I, um, that I need to do? Um, and then, um, yes, yeah, so another point of the paper is that it's... Um, so the theoretical part was very fun, to be honest, to read. But at some point, it gets a little bit lost into specification of the different uh, declination of your model. So I would love to, you know, go from, from you know, hard constraining on observables to soft constraining on observable to be a bit more fluent. So I understand that these all are part of the same uh, problem. Okay, then I have a question, um, which I don't know, I've already discussed with this with Aubrey, um, which is uh, the following. So when you do, um, so you present to us all of these um, restrictions, and then you pick one of the solutions, uh, and at that point in the paper, I w it wasn't very clear why you picked that one, it wasn't reason why you picked this um, restriction, if it's because of Antonin Diaz, Petrella and Rivera Ramirez, which I think is, the answer from your presentation. Um, can I use other restrictions? Can I can I use other solutions? And uh, I imagine yes, but I would like to have this discussed in that uh, um, in that part of the paper. 
Okay, so um, another point on this is that um, in, uh, in the application, so I really like the application because you could just uh, showcase how amazing is your model, right? How amazing is your, the methodology that you propose because you can have hard and soft constraints in, in, in observables or shocks. Uh, however, of course, a lot of things are going on. So there is uh, the discussion on the choice of the prior. Then, of course, you have shrinkage because you have a large beaver model. And then you have the impact of the different constraints on the conditional forecast. So uh, my question at the end was, it was very difficult to understand where uh, the resulting forecast coming, was coming from. So, uh, you know, if I see this, I will look to see, okay, this constraint will impact, you know, in this way, and then uh, how the old bits, you know, built up to uh, the, the resulting forecast. So this is something that I would like to see. Okay, so things that I liked a lot. Uh, so the, the things that I could understand the most was this one, the min-max tilting method for self-constraining. was very intuitive and very clear. However, I didn't really understand how this um, work into uh, the, the main, uh, um, in, into the algorithm that you use. Um, so, you know, a question maybe if it's okay, possible to write the algorithm down so I can see the single steps in this case as well. Um, and then, uh, the, so the simulation exercise was very nice because as you can see in the presentation as well, you saw that they compare their methodology with existing literature and they get exactly the same results. So this is very um, good, you know, in, because you can, sh you can see that you can obtain the same result, but, you know, in a much faster way. Uh, so this was very um, was very intuitive, and um, uh, then it, this makes me think about uh, a lot about uh, whether we can use this to have density forecasting, because in this way, so especially with the soft constrained one, which I think is the real contribution of this paper, because this paper works in a very um, unified uh, framework, but I think that where uh, the algorithm shines the most is using soft constraint and combination of soft and hard constraints. So um, I was thinking that this is actually very interesting because we can move from uh, introducing some uncertainty on the constraint on your forecast, um, which I think is very interesting. However, something that I was thinking about is that even when you use soft constraint, you are um, focusing on the mass of distribution, right? Because you, you say, you know, I think the policy rate in three years time is gonna be between 1.5 and uh, two, whatever you want. And um, um, yes, yeah, so you know, it's still on the massive distribution. So then my question for you is, how can, can I use this method to learn something about the tails? Like how can I impose the tails? I think, yes, but I'll let you answer. Um, probably in the scenario analysis. And um, okay, so just let me leave you with this point on why you should be thinking about using this methodology, okay? So I think that if you are interested in doing conditional forecasting, especially using soft constraint or a combination between soft and hard constraint, um, using a large, a large bar, which is what you know all policymakers do or should do, um, then this methodology is very good because you can achieve uh, a very high, you can have the result in a, in a very short amount of time and they are very uh, accurate. So then you know the obvious question is, where can I have the code to actually run this? Okay, thank you. So uh, we have time to take uh, questions. Simian, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. I, I think the presentation was very uh, good and convincing, especially that you have a method that can do all the other methods. But since the focus is very much on computational speed, I think you are very fast. And if you do this comparison, I think you do them in, in a matter of time. Uh, did you implement all these methods yourself? And did you use the same uh, code generator, are you in the same platform? Because if, if not, then it is always very hard just only to look at time because then one system uh, produces the code in that way. And, other. Um, and also, um, like, uh, do you look only at time or do you look at the float operating system? Because in the float operating system, that is where the actual calculations are going on. And if you do uh, an, an VAR system, a large Bayesian VAR in, in state-based model, the the companion form has many zeros and ones. So if you do the Kalman filter, you run the Kalman filter just blindly, do as if all these zeros and ones are actual real numbers yet, and then that takes an, 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 an amazing amount of time. But if you just 
identify all the zeros out and only do the computations for the updating uh, where there are non-zeros and where there are non-unities, yeah, then it is so much faster. And then it is not a fair comparison. So you should be very careful with your claims that certain things are much faster than other methods. It, it is all to do with the implementation, how you implement these methods. And so that's why I'm sort of opposing a bit these sort of general remarks that, oh, this is so much faster. So um, I've been doing, of course, some of these a lot and in papers, in policy, so that's very useful. Um, there is a recent paper by Mc, uh, McKee and uh, Christian Wolf uh, at MIT that says, well, actually, a lot of the stuff we have been doing, like the Simpsons-a or the Lieberens-a way of thinking about scenario, actually doesn't really work. Like you are still subject to the Lucas critique and uh, I guess the intuition is if I do this tilting or this conditional forecast using uh, shocks that are unanticipated or, you know, using tilting period by period, I, it's, you know, I obtain a scenario that is very different than I, if I, relative to a scenario where I anticipate everything at time zero, right? And one can think of, you know, all, I mean, it's underlying, say, our policy communication in central banks, you know, forward guidance and so on. So my understanding of that econometrica paper is that they say you are constrained in the scenario analysis of what you can do using shocks at time zero or, you know, residuals at time zero. You need to span that. So that, of course, is a bit of a killer because if you do it the hard way, at least how I understand it, it's very hard to nail the path, uh, the paths you care about. So what I was wondering is whether you could come to the rescue to some extent, because if you do it a soft way, and instead you allow for a range, then maybe you're, you're more likely to be able to implement scenarios using time t, uh, sorry, time zero uh, shocks. So, I mean, at least that was my part of the reading of what I've seen. Any other questions? Last one, yeah. Hi, Nuno Gonçalves from Banco de Portugal. I just have one question, if it's possible to set some asymmetries in the soft conditions. Yeah, thanks, Julia, for your comments. Yes, um, the, if I can remember, yeah, the prison sampler is um, the inverse of the covariance matrix. Um, the other parts, yes, probably... Um, in terms of explaining the sort of um, the the difference in terms of the hard and con hard and soft constraint algorithm, probably yeah, we probably should um, explain a little bit better. And in terms of the forecast accuracy that you asked, so basically we're not. So as we showed in the simulation, we're just um, showing our alternate method to generating conditional forecasts. And there, I think there are many applications out there. I think um, Todd Clark and Mike McCracken has done some application on conditional forecasts. So if we use our method and implement, um, you know, do the same exercise as what they did, we should get the same forecast accuracy. It's just uh, we're just proposing sort of an alternate and, uh, and a, a fast method. So in terms of imposing the tails, so um, from my understanding, we can impose sort of restrictions um, on the variance of the conditional forecast. So we can do that. Uh, we're still exploring that avenue. Um, in terms of um, the computation times um, for the other methods, so basically we do everything in MATLAB. So um, in terms of the... Um, existing the other three method methodology we just got them so for example the antonio diaz um, code that was coded in matlab and ivan sent us that so we're just directly using their code um, and also the the, the bambar et al we're also using um, i think dominico's code from that and the wagner czar code is basically um we're using uh Marek's code where he sort of published in economic letters where that he improved the at Wagner's are so we're not actually so basically we're not coding the three existing methodologies by ourselves and making up the numbers we're just using what's already out there their code and we're just comparing our method to what they're so it's sort of um yeah I, we get I understand your point we can sort of 
if we want to, we could um, probably, you know, um, um, make the common filter, the, the filtering methods more efficient, but we're just comparing on what is the available code that people are using now. And that's just, a, I think that's a fair com comparison. And um, in, ter in terms of sort of Darius' comment, um, so I'm not sure about that, but I think uh, we should, I think, because um, at the moment it's sort of, we're just illustrating this algorithm. We haven't explored that, like the, that like you said, putting a, you know, a constraint, uh, the soft constraint on the shocks, but um, we might be, we, we could look that in the future. But, but that's a good idea that we're, um, that we'll probably be interested. And uh, we can talk more, um, you and me can talk more to Josh about that. And in terms of asymmetries, in terms of the soft constraint, um, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but what we do is, I, I, if I'm interpreting it, do you mean like changing the bounds between um, periods? Yeah, so that's what we did in the, the um, um, and the input application, we can change the bounds through the forecast horizons. So you can do it. It's not, you don't have to fix the interval. You can change the interval. Um, so our algorithm allows that. It's flexible enough. Yeah. Um, thanks. Okay. Thank you very much.